This is a discussion-based group and attendees will be invited to introduce themselves briefly by name and specialty when they participate or speak in the discussion. Let me introduce leadership speaker, Donna Hartley. She will kick us off with her story about leadership and using your intuition in business. She has been featured on NBC, ABC, CBS, and in the New York Times. She's done speaking engagements before crowds of 6,000 and more, and she counts major clients as NASA, Lockheed Martin, Mayo Clinic, American Heart Association, YPO, Medtronics, and many more. Donna survived a deadly plane crash at LAX, which led to her testifying before the National Transportation Safety Board, leading to many of the airline safety measures we have today. And I'm going to share a picture of the actual plane crash. So this is, Donna was on this plane and unfortunately people did die in this plane, but she used her intuition to get off this plane. And it is shocking there's even a picture of it, but it happened at LAX many years ago. And Donna parlayed that into a career as an international speaker all over the world. So Donna, welcome. And Thank give us you. some of your tips. Oh my gosh. When I hear that story, I say, really? We're talking about me? You know, I did that? It was March 1st, 1978. I am an actress in Hollywood, heavy on the struggling because things were not going my way. I was financially, emotionally, spiritually, and mentally bankrupt. So when I hit that bottom after struggling for seven years, this is what I thought. I really thought of suicide. I really thought of ending my life. Watch what you think about and you say to yourself because you draw that energy to you. So on March 1st, 1978, I was boarding a flight to leave, Honol uh, to leave LAX to go to Honolulu. Now, I'm a former Miss Hawaii, so I thought maybe going back, this would change my life. Maybe I'd have the opportunity, you know, because life was good. I went to college there. I became Miss Hawaii, and then I came to Los Angeles for seven years. Now, I woke up that morning. Something was off. The boyfriend drove me to the airport. We broke up, okay? I was not Hollywood enough for him. Then I went to check in and my little voice said, change your seat. And it like just came out of me. So I trusted that little voice, that intuition. They changed my seat to the other side of the plane. It's the side that you saw. That's the only side survivors could get out on. So I changed to that one in the aisle, aisle seat, six rows from the exit. Then I walked down uh, the, run, the jetway and I couldn't board the plane. I couldn't board it. So I let people go by, finally I did. I sat down and this is what I said, let my life change, let it never be the same or let me die. Watch the flight attendants, look where the exit was. We took off at 167 miles per hour, one second just from liftoff, we were just starting to, and I heard boom, 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 three automatic. And something was wrong. The pilot slammed on the brakes. You felt like you were in a vice. Things started breaking apart. And flight attendant screamed, tighten your seatbelt, head between your knees. I put my head down, but I also saw Sepulveda Boulevard, all the cars, the fence. There was no question in my mind that I was going to die. None whatsoever. The plane, silent. Not a word. We came to an abrupt halt. The plane went on its side. The side I was on was jacked up 20 feet. The flight attendant said, come to the rear, come to the rear. You got in, it was just so narrow as you're walking down there. At the very end, when I wanted to go left, I fell to the right because of it being jacked up. And I was on my knees and my hands and I faced a wall of flame. That was the moment my life changed forever. Sometimes we have to be hit over the head. And that was mine because they, these words went through my head and I answered them. And I want you to answer them for yourself. They were, do you love yourself? I answered, no. Do you love your family and friends and tell them and show them? I answered, no. Are you living your goals and dreams? I answered, no. And if you die today, have you left this planet a better place 
because you were here? And I answered no. And right after that, in my insides, it wouldn't even come out. I just said, I want to live. And I scrambled back up. It was too crowded. I wasn't going to get out. And then there was a slight opening. And I shot through, but my one leg was caught behind. And I thought my legs were just going to split. And the shoe and the strap broke. And I made it down. And as I did, the evacuation slide also crashed to the ground. I got up. And I fell down because I didn't have, I'd hurt that one leg. So I started limping away. And then I heard another choo explosion. I turned around and then I didn't know if I was dead, alive, or just dreaming. So when I look back at that plane, I realized I had been given, I had been given another chance and I was not going to screw my life up after that. Okay. I saw an elderly couple escape from the middle. They both had to jump 20 feet. Unfortunately, the wife fell in the flames. The husband pulled her out. I saw unconditional love at that moment. And I said, I won't settle for anything less than that kind of love of life and people. And yes, eight vertebrae up, whip, whiplash, sprained ankle, all of that. Three days later, I did fly to Hawaii because I was on assignment. Trust me, it was not on Continental Airlines, okay? And when I got there, I was to MC the Miss Hawaii pageant. So they were just going to have to put makeup all over me where I was kind of singed and everything. But I got a call to interview for a Dick Van Dyke commercial, national. You have to understand, I studied in Hollywood. I was signed at CBS Studios. I had really not done any parts at all for seven years. And I went on that interview. And you've been on those interviews. They say, thank you very much, which means we are not calling you and do not call us. I thought, I just survived a DC-10 plane crash. And this guy's telling me I'm not good enough for this little part. I don't think so. So I stopped before walking out the room and said, no, wait, I have a feeling you're not going to hire me. I want to be a working actress. What else do I need to know? And he looked at me because, you know, like 40 other people had interviewed before me. And he said, you read the part great. You're five years too young for this role. <laughs> I killed to hear those words now. So I looked at him and said, what's the wardrobe? He said, old fashioned Mumu. I said, give me a big tank, Mumu. Pull my hair back. Get me a big beach hat. And I said, I'd be great for the part. Thank you. The phone was ringing by the time I got to my hotel room. That started over 100 appearances on TV. Small, but I reframed what he believed in me. Okay? Did the Miss Hawaii pageant, got back to Los Angeles. A guy knocks on the door, and I am slammed with a subpoena. I have to testify at the National Transportation Board of Inquiry. It's going to be Continental Airlines, McDonnell Douglas, Goodyear Tire, Pico Shoe Company. If I said... You're the reason we died. Or you're the reason we died. We're the reason people are in the burn ward. There was over 90 people in the burn ward. I said, I can't do this. Ran to my best girlfriend's house. Didn't even knock at the front door. Walked in. It's about 10 o'clock in the morning. I opened the refrigerator. And what do you think I pulled out? Wine. Two bottles. And my girlfriend says, it's not even noon. I showed her the subpoena. She said, if not you, then who? Life is short. You have to start making decisions now and doing the things you want to do, personally as well as professionally. She called the head nurse of the burn ward. She knew it. I went to the burn ward. I had no idea what to expect. I had a grip a table. I almost passed out looking at the patients. And an elderly lady was there. And she said, I saw you on that plane. And she was burned. And she was on egg cartons and, you know, to keep the air underneath. And I said, uh, uh, yes. And Phyllis, the nurse, walked me over and she said, don't let this happen to anyone else. I went out of there. I threw up. I did as much research as I could. And I testified. I waived my right to sue. So financially, I did not benefit. But I was alive. 
So when you fly on any aircrafts today, I was the one that fought for the big visual screens, for the extra slides that come down, the ropes that come down, because that's how the crew got out. They shimmied out. And also, um, uh, they have uh, the evacuation slide. They have the little lights that go down. But the three tires had exploded because they were patched and retreaded back then. They don't do that. So let me just pass on three pearls of wisdom that you can use in your life for inner leadership and for intuition. And then you can ask me questions. Okay. The number one thing is you got to trust your intuition. I had that reoccurring nut dream for one year before the plane crash. And I always saw a plane crash, but I just thought that's never going to happen, but it did happen. I didn't trust it. I didn't trust my intuition. I trusted it enough to change my seat. I trusted enough to pay the flight attendants. So now when my gut tells me something, I pay attention. So this is the formula to developing your intuition. We pray, we ask for change, but we don't shut up long enough to get the answer. That's meditation. That's getting still. That's getting quiet. That after the meditation, you get gut feelings. That's intuition. And they can come in a second and be gone. Then after that, you have to get into action. So the formula is you pray, you ask, but you have to get very clear on your intentions. Okay. I asked for change. I said, let my life change or never let it be the same. Boy, it came true in seconds. The second one, meditate. You're not going to do it all the time, but if you do it three times a week, 20 minutes, come on, you got 168 hours in a week. And you might find you do it mornings or nights. You could sit by a stream. You can download meditations. You can listen to music, but just get still because start to trust it. And then your ego gets in the way. You say, is that really my ego or is that my intuition? After you start doing it a while, you'll know when it's your gut. And then you have to take that risk and get action. Okay. So that's the formula for that. The next one is. Focus your energy. When you want something and you want change, you got to focus the energy. I was so happy to go back to the Miss Hawaii pageant and be the MC because it didn't come easy for me. So this is what I did. I finally focused my energy and I saw the end result because I ran for the title the very first year when I was in college. Okay. And I lost. I came back the second year I ran for the title and I lost. I came back the third year I ran for the title. And I lost. I came back the fourth year. I had a new gown, new hairstyle. And finally, I lost. Then I said, I am never running again. This is personal rejection. But six months before, I had to get honest with myself. And I realized I didn't have the passion. I didn't have the commitment. I didn't believe that I was a winner. So it was inside that I had to adjust. Oh, sure, I went to a photographer and a modeling agency and wardrobe and hair, but it was the inside that I said, I am Miss Hawaii. I am qualified. I am talented. It's my year. And by the way, I'm not running again. That's exactly how I felt. So when I walked down that aisle, the judges looked at me and said, give it to her. She's not going away. So whatever it is they felt, that's the year I won the title of Miss Hawaii. So I travel the world now speaking, and nobody says, here is the loser of four beauty pageants. They say, here's a former Miss Hawaii. The bottom line message is when you want something and you want that change, you're going to be tested on it over and over again. That's why you got to get really clear on your intention, and you have to go to the end result. See it, believe it, feel it, and know it. That's what makes it clear. Okay, the other one is clear communication. When you get clear with yourself and other people, that's when it happens. So remember the story when I went for the commercial? That was clear communication. I did the same thing when I got on that witness stand in front of thousands of people in that room and all these tables. Not only did I tell the facts, but I gave solutions. That's the difference. When you look at a problem, what are the solutions? So when they ask for the facts and then they question me, I would say, as a survivor of a DC-10, this is what we needed. And 
you know, why don't we have the big visual screens? Because we don't uh, pay attention to the flight attendants, right? Why didn't they have those evacuation slides? You know, the ropes there like the crew did. So I questioned and I gave solutions. So instead of saying it's good or bad, be solution oriented. Now, I know, Pam, you have a handout, right? That you're going to put in the chat that they I, have my I name and my chat. number and, and more skills. So that's... Right. Yeah. And maybe we could see if there are any questions because I know you have to run. Any okay. questions about intuition, using your intuition in the workplace? I know, um, you know, immediately comes to mind, what do you do about a toxic workplace? I see uh, Janet has a question. Janet, Hi, Janet. I do have a question. You know, you said that you had been seeing this vision for like a year of the plane, right? And what's interesting to me and what I'd love to know your thoughts are is when do you listen to your intuition? Because if you'd been listening that whole year, you would have never gotten on a plane, right? So when do you think it's your intuition versus when do you think it's your own fear talking, right? Sometimes our fear tells us not to do something. And if we mistake it for intuition, we might prevent ourselves from taking risks that could be beneficial, you know? That That is so right on and so excellent. And, and, and we all struggle with that. I even struggle with that today. So this is what I do. I get quiet, like at a meditation stage, you know, or I sit down or in my backyard or something. And I say, okay, I'm not going to look at this as good or bad or fearful, but what is for my highest good? That's the question I ask myself because I want to remove my ego. And that's, I say, what's, and I do, and I'm, other people are involved. I say, what is the highest good for all of us also? Now that I've been, I've meditated a long time. You know, so yeah. I now trust mine. But at the beginning, I realized we don't trust our intuition. And you're right, because we think, oh, my God, that's my ego. That's my fear. But that's what I get quiet for a few minutes and say, is it for my highest good? Let that be revealed to me. Let me get a feeling. Let somebody tell, you know, talk to someone. And I look for those clues. That's how I kind of developed it. That now. So I have a lot of girlfriends. And if I say I'm not going to go there or I'm canceling this, they don't even question me. They go, okay, we're not going then. You know, they know that I really focus in and I trust it and I just don't nilly willy. So that is excellent. It does take time. It does take getting quiet. It does trusting your gut. Did I make mistakes? Oh yeah, absolutely. But that's part of the learning process. There's sometimes a voice says, don't go that way because the traffic's going to be heavy. Now I'm never going to know if there was a blockage or whatever. I go the other way. So great question though. Yeah, pray, meditate intuition and action. Okay. Another question. Monica. Hi, Donna. Monica here. Thank you so much. That was so inspiring. You, you at the beginning, you said a few questions that you asked yourself. It was like, do you love yourself? Do you love family and friends? Are you living your goals? What were the other ones? I couldn't. Are wait. you living your goals and dreams was the third one goals and dreams. And if you die today, have you left this planet a better place for being here? Got we it. all take up space in this planet. So it doesn't have to be something big. I mean, you can take care of a relative. You can help rescue a dog or you can take a bigger platform. It doesn't matter. But when you look back at your life, you have to know. See, at that point, I had done nothing that I was really overly proud of. You know, I mean, I'd won Miss Hawaii but, and I got my college degree, but I hadn't really contributed anything. And that's what made the difference. I mean, that moment I was to become a speaker, you know, I didn't know it, but it was kind of chosen for me. That's what I was going to do, help people. So, uh, yes. So those are the qu four questions Thank you. that I faced death, thought I was going to die. And those are the four questions I faced. Zena. Hi, Donna. Uh, incredible story. Oh, there you are. I feel Hi. like we could have used the entire hour to learn from you and listen to you, but uh, you're a hard act to follow. So, but Donna, I'm super curious about these incredible life experiences that you've had and how you transitioned that from those learning lessons and those life experiences into the leadership speaker that you are. Could you speak to that a little bit? I think all of us could be inspired by sort of learning about that journey. Okay. So I left Hollywood after two years, you know, of, and I acted those small parts I moved to Lake Tahoe, where I live now, where it was quiet. I had to go in and I had to heal. I had to figure out who I was and what I wanted. So those journaling, meditation, quiet outside in nature, I found out who I was. Then I was asked from Reno, Nevada, to teach young people in acting. 
because I was an actress. So, and then I done, so I did that. This is what happened. I was so passionate. I was teaching these teenagers. Their parents saw the difference in the teenagers and they hired me for corporations. I didn't even do a business plan because I was following my passion. I mean, I didn't even know there was kind of paid speakers at the time, okay? Then I joined the National Speakers Association. Then I learned, oh, I have to get videos. I have to get pictures. And then I wouldn't even talk about the plane crash in the beginning because I thought it was like self-indulgent, right? And at the very end, I'd say, and I survived the plane crash. And they go, hold it, hold it, say more. So what I did, yes, it was a learning curve. I had to join the national speakers. I had to figure out what to do. I had to get them up to market. I had to learn how to market. I had to, you know, the whole internet thing. So I learned it step by step by step. Have I screwed up? Oh my God, here we go again. You know, then I had to figure out a price range and, uh, you know, and I went to uh, experts and I paid experts on a video and all the things you have to do. But I kept moving forward. And yes, I lost clients, other people took them over, those kind of things. That's part of the learning process. But have I worked all over the world? Yes. Have I had a full-time career? Yes. Have I had to change it and then there's Zoom and then I have to do coaching? It, so it changes all the time. I wish it would stay the same because now I got it down. I learned it and then they change it on me. So I've said, okay, well, here's the new step. You have to learn it. Um, and then the whole technology thing threw me off. But here I am again, learning it all. So Yes, I write out and, and I'm one of those that every week I set my attention for the week. Now, hire new clients. I'm doing a women's retreat. How many new women I need to come to Pennsylvania for that? So I write it out every week. And if it doesn't get accomplished, it goes on the next week or it goes on the next week. Or I go, I can't do this. I need some help. So I have to look for somebody that can help me in that field. Did that Rhonda? answer the question? Rhonda? Yeah. Well, first, I just want to say how incredibly inspiring you are. I mean, this is like amazing. And and I can't even echo, uh, you know, how much I agree with following your intuition. I, I literally remember a time when I had spent $500 to spend a day with a coach and I couldn't find my keys. And I was frantic. I was nuts. I always kept them in the same place. And I called her and I said, I, you know, I don't know what to do. I can't find my keys. Don't know how I'm going to get there. And she just goes, sit down in a chair for five minutes, be quiet and just ask where are your keys, right? Five minutes later, I go back. They were exactly where they were supposed to be, but I didn't see them. It turned out I missed a huge accident. Had I been oh, five, if had I left five minutes earlier, I would have been over the fence, right? So the other thing too, that I just want to add too is, um, cause I, I actually love, love, love your whole message, Donna. And I was... If you actually put out to the universe what you want, the universe works in really strange ways, right? So I was divorced and um, I remember sitting in my therapist's office and she said, Rhonda, what do you want? I said, I want to marry Bob again. That was, I'm, I'm, I'm engaged to somebody else and I want to marry my ex-husband. So I, I literally call my ex and I said to him, hey, if we were both single, would you date me again? And his answer was no effing way. I went, okay, thanks. And literally in my mind, I thought, you know what, this is what I want. And I just kept moving forward in my life to a place that I was going to be a better person. Well, fast forward to six months later, I re I, I reconnected with him. And six months later, I remarried him. And that was eight years ago. So the, the reality of it is I so echo everything you say, you know, whatever you need shows up. It's all about your energy. And when you don't listen to that little voice, that's when you run into trouble. It's, it's so, so true. I can't wait to read your books. I mean, like, I'm just like, this is like the best hour of the day. I don't know where you came from, but you're amazing. And um, just thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions before we wrap it up? I know we have a time limit here. So Pam, any more questions? I don't see any more hands. Thank you so much for coming. I put the sheet into the chat so they have your information. They can follow up on your website. Thank you so much, okay. Donna. Well, before I hang up, I'm going to tell one little last story here. First of all, if you go to my website, I have this women's retreat you'll see coming up in Pennsylvania, a long weekend in October when the leaves are fabulous. And I have a masterclass online I teach every January. So if you're interested, put your name on that list. So besides, besides what I went through, I had malnutrition as a kid. Okay, here's the little one. She already put it up. I'm That's her family. 
<laughs> yeah, leave it up. Yeah, that malnutrition as a kid. Then I had my first heart surgery in my teens. Then I had the plane crash. Then I had melanoma. Then I had heart surgery and I had heart surgery again. This last heart surgery came during the pandemic. I just got this little one during the pandemic and I had the surgery. They replaced a valve inside of my aortic valve and I couldn't get any therapy, any, you know, heart for therapy. So I bought a stroller and this little one, Starry, walked 500 miles with me in the neighborhood. And that's how I recovered from heart surgery. So my closing message to you is when a difficult situation comes up, there's always a solution. It might not be the normal solution, but find it. And this little one is absolutely the one that loves me unconditionally. Thank you so much. It was my honor to speak for you. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Okay, we are moving on. And I know that's a, a little overwhelming plane crash and survival, but um, she is an inspiration. Thank you, Donna. You're welcome. So now we're going to change topics and talk about personal branding for women. And what is the best way for a woman to develop her own brand? I know that Rhonda, it is Rhonda still here. Rhonda has a very specific brand. She's amazing. She speaks consistently. But we do have an expert here. Janet is here. <laughs> she is she is in marketing and branding. What is the best way for us to get started? Because sometimes we're all over the place and our branding mm -hmm. message is not specific. Yeah. You know, and and Rhonda, uh, Rhonda, I think I've actually heard you speak on on before. So I think that you know a lot in this space. You know, I think that there's three key things to your personal brand. And the one is what makes you unique, right? What do you do better than anyone else? I think the second thing is what are your values? And I think the third thing is what are your contributions? And I think when you understand what those are, then you understand how to put yourself out in the world. And we've all seen friends who go out there and on LinkedIn or wherever, like it's just a stream of information about themselves, right? And and for for a lot of us in business, like LinkedIn is the place where we can show ourselves and our brand most readily. And if you understand kind of what makes you unique, what your values are and what your contributions have been, I think it helps you narrow your focus on what you wanna be known for, what you're good at and what people should take away. And in marketing, you know, we always say you could do one thing well. We tell our clients this every day. You could do one thing well, you could do two things mediocre and you could do three things poorly. So you have to figure out if, what is the one thing you do really well and then make that what you talk about. And some of it too is what do you what are you trying to do in your branding, right? I think that, you know, we want to be known for our for our competence and our abilities. And I think we want to be magnetic so that people are attracted to us. And if we're a consultant and we want customers, then we have to think about it from their point of view. And so that's having the audience always in mind. So when you're communicating what you know they want to hear from your point of view. Uh, I think that that's typically the best thing to do. And, and on LinkedIn, they have so many great tools too for how to do that. Even for me, when I'm asked to speak on something, when I'm asked to judge something, I'm in advertising and I run a creative department. So I typically, um, you know, I know if I'm speaking on something that's in my wheelhouse, then that's great. And that's something that I want to talk about and promote because that will get me more of the same thing, right? That's going to continue to be like a flywheel of the more you do that and the more you reinforce that, the more you get of that. Erica, I know you just changed some of your branding. Um, how has that process gone to match your story? Um, it's been a little haphazardy, you know, um, because um, I, well, I, I recently went through a transition with my ex-business partner. And so he was the one that was primarily if not, I think a, a lot of that, that, I guess you call it the face of the company. And so then in transitioning, I guess that to myself, um, that was a little difficult for me because I've always been kind of like in the background. Um, but I think that it's come, come about with the clients where they feel that, you know, like we are providing more kind of like hand holding for them. And so since my company, it's also a hundred percent women owned now, it's, uh, so it's a different message and also a different tone of voice that we speak to the clients in. Um, so, but it's, it's, you know, I think it's been more positive than negative. Absolutely. 
I mean, uh, I think you've really done a lot of work and a lot of homework before you took the leap. <laughs> right? Uh, yes, there a lot of thought process went into it before I took the leap. But, um, you know, you kind of like go through it, just like the lady beforehand said, um, Donna, you know, it's like um, sometimes when you have a lot of challenges in front of you, you just need to kind of find solutions to them. And so you overcome. Jenna, you're really good at branding. I see your messages all over LinkedIn and you're consistent. Um, how have you approached branding for your your company and yourself? Um, I think the questions that actually Janet posed were really key. I I have been, um, as an executive coach, like if I'm not practicing what I'm preaching and thinking about these things myself for my business, then how can I possibly like serve my clients in the same way? And by the way, I'm not a branding expert, but I'm just saying like, if I'm not asking myself questions that are important to ask myself and model that, um, then like, how are my clients going to see and have credibility for me? Um, so it was really like quite a bit of reflection and talking to, I created an advisory board before I started my business. Um, and really one of the people in that advisory board, um, and they would like rotate, I'd rotate what kinds of experts would be in the advisory board. Um, one of them was in marketing and it was to make sure to protect that I was not only clear about how to deliver content in a way that I thought would be unique and helpful and authentic for what I wanted my company to represent, but also to make sure that that was consistent and I could get feedback early on to protect that branding, if you will. That's amazing. That's smart. I didn't think about getting an advisory board and then having some specialists, you know, what is a second opinion? I always need a yeah. second set of eyes and yeah. a lot of people don't do that. And by the way, like if anyone wants to create their own advisory board, the ad people in my advisory board, I created it systematically so that they could also get value by meeting the people on the advisory board <laughs> to network and connect with um, that I thought they would be really impressed by. So it wasn't just them using my time for just the goodness of their hearts. They were also going to get value in different ways by doing it. So a little tidbit there. That's great. Monica, I feel like you are branded separately from your company, but also with it. So a company handles your branding, right? But you also have great messaging. Is that a um, conscious well, choice or? Yeah, I mean, we're working on it. Um, we actually just hired um, an outside marketing consultant who's doing a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, our marketing director just presented, um, we have a, a sales marketing team every Thursday. And she just presented some stats on like SEO and like back end work that we just don't have time to do, you know, and it's not our expertise anyways. So we, we outsource that. Um, but um, in terms of like global branding, I'll share with you guys, we're going through a big change right now. So assessments 24 seven is like one of many things that we do, right? It's kind of like the storefront for psychometric assessments. So we sell disc motivators, emotional intelligence, and we sell the consultants and corporations around the world, right? But the other thing that we do is actually create assessments and like the technology that supports psychometrics for other assessment companies. So like think of us as like Google, like they're all sitting on our technology but the websites are all branded to that particular company, right? Um, and so we're doing a new marketing play to market that and say instead, just assessments, we are the global assessment technology provider. So that's part of what the marketing guys are going to do for us um, is create that logo and whatever, call it whatever we want. But that's like a big project we're working on this year to to pretty much totally rebrand. It's almost like the global assessment technology companies will be the parent company. Assessments 24 seven will be one of those businesses uh, underneath. That's a big job. So that's kind of a big thing that we're doing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't have to do it. But right. <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie, as a management consultant, do you give them um, your company's feedback about branding? And then how do you brand yourself separately than so many management consultants? 
Yeah. So we, um, we do a marketing assessment as part of our overall assessment when we're doing business strategy and business assessment. I actually have 20 plus years of experience in strategic marketing uh, within larger companies and larger organizations uh, before I started Ascentium. And uh, so, you know, so I'm looking at it from that perspective, but it, I think part of for at least like, as I was putting together the brand for Ascentium, um, really thinking about who's our target audience. And when I think when you first start out, everyone's your target audience because you're just looking to get started and make some money and sort of, you know, sustain your families or yourselves or whatever it is that you started your business to do. Um, but one of the things that I found is that I've been in business five years now. And one of the things that I've found is that over time, we went back and looked at who did we work with. So we worked with whomever sort of came through the door and we connected with and seemed to work. And we just sort of did that. We knew the kind of work that we wanted, but not necessarily for whom. And it was really interesting because as we go back or as we're putting together sort of references and things in our our, in our proposals, uh, there's a, a persona that has kind of just naturally formed around supporting women executives when they are looking for help with their boards of directors or their leadership teams or or to find what's new and what's next for their businesses, um, they tend to gravitate towards us and particularly women of color for whatever reason. Um, you know, I don't know if they just feel seen more, seen by us or whatever, but um, we didn't start out to be a business for women from a client perspective, but it's turned out to be a set of, of women inside our business. And also we tend to serve more women leaders than men leaders for whatever reason. But so I think it's kind of, um, you know, yes, part of it is about being intentional, but also I think part of it is evaluating where you've been and seeing are there patterns or things there that would help you target and find the audience that resonates best for you. Well, that's fascinating. Yes. Did somebody say something? No. Um, when I, when I go for a doctor, right, I want to have a female doctor. So <laughs> I would want a female management consultant. Yeah. I mean, we just listen differently, right? We, right. we see things differently. We're, we're keyed into things. Oh, and you asked about differentiation. That's part of what, how we've now def differentiated our brand working with Ken Boynton, who's also uh, was a, a high rise member um, with message glue, he helped us to find this story about working at the intersection of strategy and teams. And so that's how we differentiate our consulting practice. It's at the different, it's at the intersection of strategy and teams, not leaders, but teams of leaders. Fascinating. Denise, how do you brand yourself? I think you have to unmute. I'm sorry. There you go. Okay. Um, um, well, we're a fairly new company and it's pretty, you know, it's been a year and a half. So I really brand myself as having expertise in the PEO space, the professional employer organization space. And after working in it for eight years, um, being able to help comp those companies that are looking to evaluate the benefits of being in one and does it really pay? Are they getting the benefit out of the cost? So doing an initial like fee assessment for them and educating them and then helping them with the transition and all the moving pieces. So being very consultative with them um, and being able to show them uh, the level of expertise we have to make it a smooth transition and they don't have to worry about making such a big change with their company and bringing in the necessary resources that they may need on the HR side, on the payroll side, on the insurance side. Um, so it's it's a very niche, we're, we're very niche say, focused. Very really. niche. Really. It really is. It, yeah, it's very niche. Yeah. Michelle, you're a lawyer, right? So the law firm brands you, they have a big marketing department and they're branding all the time. How do you separate your brand from the legal side? 
Yeah, so first of all, thank you very much for having me today. I appreciate it. And it's also a pleasure to meet all of you wonderful women here. It's very inspiring to hear every single one of you speak um, and to learn a lot from each one of you. Um, with regard to the law firm, so it's actually very new. I just started this three months ago. Um, I previously worked for uh, a securities firm. Thank you, Jenna. Um, I previously worked for a securities firm for uh, 10 years, and I did securities derivative and class actions. And um, being the only female attorney, uh, the only person with children, uh, it was quite challenging. So I, I'm i also an advocate. I'm part of Chamber of Mothers, which is a national advocacy or um, organization, and I'm the chapter facilitator here for San Diego. And um, it spoke to me as far as wanting to have more of a position of helping women, uh, not just in our community, but in general from a legal perspective. And so I, I formed Gallen Law. Um, so with regard to, to branding, this is all very new. And I luckily, I have a good support system of women, um, you know, that that I, I've worked with previously, um, whether they were people that worked for other firms or people that I just know in general, that have really have been kind of my personal advisory sounding board. Um, so I've been able to bounce ideas off of them. And, you know, I, I truly, I, I was just having a conversation with one of them the other day that I'd be lost without them because I'm being an attorney. I'm not you know, marketing is not my expertise. I, uh, I, I can, my sketch for even my logo was something that I'm, I'm pretty sure my three-year-old twins could have probably put together. Um, so, uh, luckily, you know, I have some really good girlfriends that have been wonderful and have supported me and helped me kind of make this, uh, this next step in my life. And it's, it's been wonderful um, so far. So I'm I'm absolutely really excited to see where the marketing and branding goes and how that helps. And I'm really learning a lot and it's, it's a work in progress, certainly. Well, congratulations to you, Janet. Thank you. Yeah, you, you know, as you're talking about a company branding versus personal branding, I have a recommendation for you. Uh, the Small Business Administration has a lot of tools for people to help them with marketing and all of that stuff when you start your own business. And they have a group called SCORE, which is the Service Core of Retired Executives. And these are people who may have had a background in marketing, have had a background in things that can help you. And I mean, you know, the Small Business Administration is paid for with our taxes. So it's like, you know what I mean? It's like, it's a good resource for you. But when you think about like you're branding a company, that's not personal branding. When you need help with that, there's tons of great resources for you there that I think you'll find a lot of, um, you'll get a lot of use out of because they've got a lot of stuff there exactly for that. What made you great in law doesn't make you great at branding, right? So that's a good tool. And I also recommend, um, you know, AI and everything can do a lot when it comes to making logos and helping you write copy. I'm an AI junkie. So, um, you know, say what you want to say, ask chat GBT or or a co-pilot or something to say it for you better. Um, I'm using it myself and I'm a writer. So, you know, there's those tools too. So just want to throw that out there. I love that. Stephanie? Yeah, I had a question for Janet or, or anyone else who might have some insights on this. Um, you know, one of the things that I struggle with as a small business owner is I am trying to build a business and not just a practice. And so how do I balance that my personal brand? Because I have a lot of loyal followers. I have a lot, a huge network from growing up in industry and, and all of the different work and, and communities that I'm a part of. And so I have a really strong positive brand there, though it's maybe not as articulated as a, my company brand, but how do you bridge those gaps, say, on, you know, just in in when I'm going to a conference or on LinkedIn or, or whatever? Any thoughts on that, Janet? Yeah, I, I have some thoughts. I think that for so many of us, we are what we do. You know what I mean? And especially if you own a small business, like that business is you, especially when you're first starting it. And you, you rely a lot on your personal brand and that's what's going to attract people to you. And I think I'm going to go back to making sure that you know, um, like what your values are, what your accomplishments are, right? And make sure that you're communicating that. And I think depending on what you're trying to do and where you're trying to communicate it, right? That will change. When you're out talking to people about your business, you're you, right? And you're attracting them to that just based on who you are. But when the conversation turns to something that you're a pro at, right? Or something that you're like, hey, I actually do this for a living. I'm happy to talk to you or whatever, stuff like that. 
I mean, it's hard with small business because you're everything, right? You wear every hat. You know, I, um, I do a lot of uh, mentoring, especially for women in um, minority and immigrant owned businesses in the Chicago area, because what makes you great at what you do isn't great at what makes you be in marketing and stuff. And, and it's the one thing we try to help them understand, like you are your business and they're the same. And for some people, it's a problem only because they post all kinds of stuff out in the world that has nothing to do with their business. Right. You know what I mean? Especially like small, small business. You're like, stop posting that garbage. Like you've got a business you're trying to run. Right. Um, but in the professional spaces, it's not quite as bad, but you know, it, it's a line that you do walk because you are you and you're the face of your organization. So I think if anything, there's a greater weight on your personal brand because you do represent your business too. Right. Yeah, so, but I don't want it to be that way forever, right? That's the thing is that I want to build a business that can stand without me. Yep. So it's that transition that from <clears throat> the startup mode to building an actual business that stands without me. Yes. And that I think is the tricky part. And, I, and for that, the business has to be able to exist without you then, right? Yeah. It has to be not all about you. And so if the business has your name on it, right, then you're the anchor. When you anchor the brand, you're always going to kind of be part of Yeah. Doesn't just good. <laughs> right? Yeah, good. But so, yeah, but, um, what you're saying. Right, but Michelle, her, you know, it's gone in law. So you right. are the anchor of some of that, and it doesn't mean it's completely dependent. I mean, then you have to have a strategy for how do you grow from a startup into a business, right? And I think too that that's something where you have to have, you know, your three, five, ten year plans, right? What is it you're trying to do? And as you're bringing other people in, how do you let other people also be the face of the company brand? So you can just be the face of Stephanie, right? Yeah. And then also it, it's like, if you worked for anybody, how do you represent that company, but still represent you, right? Yeah, thank you. Jenna? Uh, I'll just add to that if it's helpful, Stephanie. Um, one of the things that I, um, I've had clients who have experienced some of this and um, they take us a, a step back and think about, well, what is it about your brand that has built your brand to be what it is and how can you emulate that through your business brand so that they can start to build that buy-in for your business brand separate from your brand. Um, so there's a little bit of um, like before you create the strategy, there's identifying some of those key components um, to be able to, you know, kind of focus on your business brand and enhancing not just your audience, but the things that have been able to, um, that you can take from your current brand into your business brand and keep it valuable there. Absolutely. So is there anybody else who wants to add their two cents or their story or Sharon, you're in tech, right? Yeah, I'm in um, healthcare and tech. Um, just um, so the personal brand has been a particularly important one for me. Um, I've had to uh, continue to stay authentic across, you know, working in a number of countries. So I've worked in, you know, six countries, four continents, five plus industries. And so I really loved what um, uh, Janet was saying about the values and the contributions and the uniqueness. Uh, what I found is the contributions come easier. Like as you start to process, you know, how have I contributed? Contributed. Uh, it's easier. The, as you get older, the values become uh, easier to say. I found as a younger person, I could talk about my contributions and to some extent my uniqueness but my values were always hidden until I started you know, running teams and empowering people in a different way. Uh, then values became really important. Um, so I started out on the marketing side and quickly moved over to more of the general strategy and performance areas. So I, I feel like I left marketing behind, but I demand a lot out of it. So I work really well with uh, with marketers and um, I've worked with some amazing marketers. I think bouncing off those ideas about who you are so important with somebody who has been schooled in the art of marketing and continues to, to be in the space. 
So uh, I, it just resonated with a lot of what was said already. And it's my first time, so. Welcome. I, <laughs> We're glad to have you. Thank Monica, you. did you have something? I had a question. So a part of the business is selling to consultants, right? So they buy at wholesale the like a disc assessment and then they resell it to their clients for a profit, right? And a lot of these consultants are like new solopreneurs and um, sometimes we'll like go over their website and I'll do just a little bit of advice um, on what they should focus on. And so many times, and I just kind of wanted to ask your advice if this is good or not, but so many times they'll make like this generic website and it's like the skyline of Phoenix. I'm like, who cares? Like you can work globally. Like, who are you? Like, I want to see your face. I want to see your experience. I want to see your plane crash and how you survived. And now why are you a consultant? Because their whole like business is selling their expertise. So it's a very like self-branded business usually like the successful ones are, but like that kind of goes against what Stephanie's saying. Like, how do you then create a sustainable business that doesn't need your face? Like maybe that isn't good advice to give them because it's all about them and they want to go to the beach in Hawaii. Then what do they do? Like, maybe I'm giving them bad advice about that. Janet? You know, it it depends on so many things too, because for some businesses, having a website, you just have to have it so people know you're real, right? It all depends right. on the function of the website and the business. If you run an e-commerce company, you've got to have a pretty good, you mean like, it, it all depends on what the function of that website is in your in your company um and that that would make the difference but yeah a lot of the time you when you're sharing photos of yourself in hawaii your business will feel smaller than when you show a photo of phoenix right and a lot of it is what are you trying to convey who's your audience what do you need them to to think feel and know and so that's you know how do how do they validate if they're going to the website to say oh i really want you know, I, I've heard about Monica. I want to hire her. I've heard about, you know, Michelle, I want to hire her. Going to the website is a validation point normally in professional services. It's a validation to say, oh, they're real. They really exist. They have clients. I can see this is true and real. This isn't someone in a garage or just, you know what I mean? It gives that validation. So that that's going to be a big differentiator for people. When, when you've got yourself in Hawaii, it's like, oh, this might be a side hustle, right? This might not be an actual full focus company. If you think about, you know, I have a friend who's a realtor slash travel agent slash, right. You've, you know, these people. And so you can tell that. And it's like, if I want an executive coach, I want to go to Jenna's site and see, this is what she does this. And she's got the creds, right? So you, you really have to consider your audience and what they need to know and what their use of that websites can be. Jenna, did you have a final word before we move on? I just wanted to add, like, again, I'm not obviously a marketing or branding expert, but I think just in meeting a lot of consultants and coaches in the industry, um, I don't like, yes, it depends on um, also their vision. Like what, what do they, what do they want with their practice? Like they might want, I know tons of coaches and tons of consultants. It's always just going to be them. <laughs> so, you know, and even where they are in their stage of their business it might be them for the next five years, but they have a goal 10 years or five years from now to add a team, but you don't have to take ownership for that, Monica. Like that's like, so the advice you give them could be really valuable because it's where they're at. Um, however, it could be a really interesting thing to consider understanding where they're at and where they're going, what they want in the next X amount, two years, three years from now. So you know how to qualify them for what kind of advice you're going to share with them and how you're going to leverage the the relationship, right? Imagine like having different tiers of different types of consultants and coaches and leveraging them in different ways for both benefits, right? Yeah, that's a really good idea, actually. Okay, we are going to move on. That was fascinating. We could probably spend an hour and a half on that. Um, <laughs> these are great topics. Um, Zena, we're moving on to Zena. 
Zena is a recruiter with Pop Up Talent. She is amazing. Um, she knows everything about everything going on in employment today. And she's going to give us a little advice about keeping everything up to date, our CV, our resume. Um, a lot of people let this lapse for 10 years, 20 years. They don't update all their information, not on LinkedIn, not on their CV. Zena, what is your advice to everyone to keep stay in, on top of it and be relevant in the market. Sure. I think especially a lot of us because we're leaders or business owners or self-employed, we don't think about this too much. Um, but I think um, it's critical because we forget more than we remember on what it is that we've accomplished, our success stories, our numbers, um, how to quantify and qualify the things that we've done and the contributions that we've made. So I think consistently updating, even if it sits on the shelf and, and you dust it off only to update it, that it's important to keep that sort of ongoing running document. It's like in sales, we say always be selling. Well, in you're selling yourself as an employee or a potential business partner or, or what have you. So it's important to always continually update that information. Um, I will by no means... Uh, compare myself to Rhonda. She is the LinkedIn guru, but I will talk to you about we, what we as recruiters look at when we look at a resume and when we look at a LinkedIn profile. Um, it's proven that when someone looks at a resume or a LinkedIn profile as a recruiter or human resources professional, uh -huh. that they look at very specific things. Uh, it was an aha moment. Uh, they look at very specific things. And uh, within six seconds, of them looking at that information, they decide whether they're interested, not interested, they either count you in or count you out. So it's important to figure out when I look and open up a PDF or a Word document, where are my eyes drawn, right? And the same thing with the LinkedIn profile. Initially, when you're looking at a profile, not to do business with another person, but to see if there's someone you want to partner with, uh, hire, recruit them for your organization. If you're the candidate, we're going to look first and foremost at where do you currently work? What is your tenure? And what is your title? The universal things, right? And so consistently people aren't found on LinkedIn because they don't take the time to do something as little as putting their dates or putting their title or they do, they make mistakes. Like they put a title. It would be, if it's an HR, for example, it might be HR dash forward slash human resources manager, dash or forward slash, those things make you unsearchable, right? I can't find you, number one. And then it looks really messy when I look at your profile. So the best thing to do is to use a space or a comma if you want to use human resources director, comma, HR, right? As opposed to a forward slash or an, or, um, an ampersand or anything like that. Um, the other thing is making sure um, on your resume that you're not doing things that, that can cause age discrimination. Um, if you went to college and you have your degree, just put your degree. We don't care if it was 1977 that you graduated or 1987 that you graduated, right? Let them figure that out by forcing you over to their applicant tracking system where you're enforced to fill out an application and put in your graduation dates. But for the, per for the purpose of initial reaction and initial influence, you don't need to include that information. Um, and you should also have your working document resume where you're keeping your data. You can reference back to it should you ever decide to rebrand yourself or transition to something different. You can go back and pull out that information, recall that information and utilize it in a way that's meaningful for you. But then you always want to have that short version, right, of, uh, of your resume to just really highlight your personal brand and the message that you want to relay as the expert that you are. Um, as far as LinkedIn is concerned, it's really important that somewhat your LinkedIn profile as a candidate looking for a job mirrors the experience that you have. You quantify and you qualify your experience, right? So stay away from the adjectives, stay away from uh, the pronouns and speaking about yourself in I or me and make sure you reference and quantify and qualify the experience and draw and utilize data-driven information, right? Um, you can tell me that you grew the company and you can have one bullet point, but you can also tell me that you grew the company from $50,000 in revenue to 50 million in revenue. And that tells me a much bigger story and a much more important story, 
right? So a lot of profiles on LinkedIn and people that are actively looking and can't find work, it's because they have those incomplete profiles. They're not findable. They're using very just strange messages. And there's all kinds of cheats. And if you've listened to Rhonda's presentation, she shared many of them with you. Um, you, you can sneak your about us uh, contact information into the about us section of your LinkedIn profile, right? Making it, uh, eligible for someone to be able to reach out to your personal website or to email you directly or what have you. There's other tips for being found on, on LinkedIn. And I'm hoping I'm not stealing anything, Rhonda, that you were going to share. Um, but it's super important that you increase your visibility, right? How do you do that without connecting with every person that you ever talk to, have a meeting with, see in a networking event? You can do that by simply joining groups. I think it's 50 or 52 groups that you can join on LinkedIn. If you don't like the group, you drop off. If it doesn't serve you anymore, you drop out and you join another group. But just being in those groups alone, whether it's an alumni organization, if you're an HR professional, it might be joining an SHRM group where they have thousands or, you know, of, of people that are in those organizations. And that alone increases your visibility. And many of us, may never need a resume ever, ever again, right? But if you decide to pivot or rebrand that reference information so that you can do that will enable you and help you to be able to do that. So I think um, staying away from adjectives that don't tell me anything, manage, you know, drove, don't tell me what you managed and tell me why you made a difference in the company. We have a very outdated way, especially in college, of how to create a resume of the content that needs to go in. Um, and it just doesn't serve for today's purposes. And I, I would assume a lot of people know this, but stay away from over graphic resume, pictures on resumes, um, keep your profile picture on LinkedIn professional. Um, you know, if you don't have a professional headshot, you can still do a selfie. There's AI tools now that can create great professional photo pictures that you can use on your LinkedIn profile, but keep them off your resume. Um, when I was in school, they taught us to put references available upon request. It's a given. You don't need to add that to your resume. Um, I would suggest that you don't go back more than 10 years on your resume or on your LinkedIn profile because you don't want to age yourself, right? Um, all kinds of different tricks and, and, and tips like that. Um, CVs are typically used in academia and they're more often used in Europe, but in the US, oftentimes they're interchangeable words. So unless you're working in academia, if somebody says, send me your CV or send me your resume, a resume typically will always suffice. Um, any questions? I have so many things that I could talk about on this subject. I don't want to go down a rabbit hole. So, I mean, I could go on literally for hours, probably just in general, but just about the subject. So is there any specific questions that I could address or, or answer? I did have a quick question. So I talked to a recruiter this morning, a male recruiter, and he told me two things, that there are certain companies who ask him for no female candidates, right? They only want to hire men and they will not hire over 35. What's the question? I mean, so what do you illegal. do? What do you do? And I guess maybe you've answered some of that is we really need to take off dates on our resume that date us, right? That expose mm -hmm. that. Otherwise he wouldn't know, right? Yep. Um, uh, and well, I mean, for me, that would be an educational moment to uh, for me and my customer. And I need to make a decision on whether that's a customer that I want to work with, right? I mean, they're setting you up to take on their liability as a recruiter or a right. professional. So that, that scares me. The ethics involved in scare me. Um, on, um, you know, LinkedIn, it's perfectly okay these days, unless Rhonda has different direction to use your pronouns. Do not use pronouns in your resume. It should be completely free of pronouns. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of laws in place that permit even at saying, you know, I want three to five years of experience. You can only say you want three plus years of experience, right? You can't put a top number on that. Like in California, it's going to open you up for lawsuit because you're now eliminating more senior mid to senior level candidates. So um, I think that that recruiter needs educated because what he should say is that we have a culture where we like to hire entry-level professionals, new college grads, because they come into our training program, we assign them a mentor and they excel and do well, you know, and they fit better into our compensation plan. Oftentimes, uh, people who are more seasoned 
are not interested in our entry-level roles or our more junior or associate-level roles. That would be an appropriate way to deliver that information as opposed to saying, we like young people or uh, don't send me anybody over the age of 35. You know, and I surpassed 35 a couple decades ago. So the fact that that's, <laughs> that, that, that's, that's a thing, I know, right? Yeah, I had no idea that I was in that category, but you know, that, that was an educational moment for me. Any uh, questions for Zena? Is it a beat? Is, is it you answered so many? You answered so many of the questions that I had already. So thank you. <laughs> you're you're absolutely welcome. My pleasure. Like I said, this is a topic that I mean, no matter what we pick on, whether it's your LinkedIn profile, your resume, your objective on your resume, the content that you put into the your resume. I would say, you know, another thing too, uh, just to mention is I here lately I've I have seen a lot of resume profiles where they take, just this morning, I talked to someone who, who graduated from Rutgers and it was on the third page of her resume and she can't find a job, but she has amazing experience. Um, and if you look at her resume, the bottom line is if in the first six seconds, I, I, this, there's companies that require a degree and I'm not going to read to the third page. We're busy, we're short staffed. You're not gonna read to the third page to find out if she has a degree, right? So put that education at the top, make sure you get it in there. Don't put your graduation date, but make sure it's there. And if you've been in industry for 10 years and you've built your professional career, don't put high school diploma on your resume and tell your kids not to do it either. It's just, you know, it's just not necessary because your education at the point doesn't matter. It's what you've accomplished, your contribution, your career path, you know, the value proposition that you bring. And I think the key thing about LinkedIn and the key thing about a resume is it's an outdated time of putting your adjectives Com, you know, util, utilizing all these words to speak in gross generalities. A resume and a LinkedIn profile these days for a, a job applicant is about what can I contribute? When? How can I hit the ground running? What are my differentiators? Even your soft skills can make a difference. Not everyone has great communication skills. You know, you can say you're a great communicator and then your grammar and your spelling errors are all over to prove otherwise, right? So really the proof is in the pudding. Drive home your value proposition. Um, your differentiators, how you're going to take everything that you've garnered, all your accomplishments, your skills, experience, your unique things, and you're going to bring those same values and contributions to that new organization in a more meaningful or in a different way. And if you can relay that message on LinkedIn and on your resume profile, you'll differentiate yourself as a candidate. Wow. Zina, I've, been, I've had a lot of conversations with folks recently about the distinction between sort of a uh, what I'll call a polymath, someone who's been in lots of different roles and done lots of different mm -hmm. things. And those people who have sort of grown up in a particular profession yeah. or industry, yes. right? So, you know, it, associate in marketing all the way up to, you know, CMO or whatever, or, or yeah. someone who's always been in, I don't know, manufacturing of widgets. Nursing, right. Yeah. yeah or nursing, right. Um, so how as a polymath do you, um, navigate this world of automated resume screening and things like that? Well, I think it's up to the candidate to determine what do they want to accomplish, right? Because if you don't know, then me as a resume reader, how am I supposed to know? If you're applying for a position in sales and you've been a lead customer service call center representative for 20 years, how am I supposed to connect the dots? I need you to tell me how we're going to connect the dots between all these different experiences in banking and call center, whatever it might be, and how we're going to relay that to a corporate inside sales job. Right. So I think so it's how really does that look on a resume. Sorry to interrupt, but like, so how does that look? Right. Because the traditional resume sort of has your, this is my experience chronologically. Yeah. I, I think in those circumstances, it would be great if we had some sample resumes, but in those examples, what I would encourage someone to do is also number one, let's figure out what they're trying to accomplish. But a lot of times, just like a, we spoke about a nurse, similar. If you're a nurse, I don't want to see a 15-page resume of med surge, ICU, ER, triage, right? You're a nurse, 20 years, you graduated here, and then here's what, you, what you've accomplished as a nurse. And you can narrow it down to probably a one-page, maybe a two-page resume. I think in this instance, where you have a poly... Uh, poly job hopper or poly career professional, it's really, tr you want to hone in on what they want to do. And I would summarize that experience to target what it is that you're trying to accomplish. So 
if you've done all these different things and for example, if you want to be an executive assistant or you want to join a board of directors and you've done all these volunteer jobs as a board of director, then lead with that. Don't lead with your experience in being an administrative assistant or a call center representative or a manufacturing production professional. I think it's just important to, and you can have a resume that's tailored for the roles that you want. You might have a general resume that you use, but for this specific targeted opportunity with this poly experience, you summarize it on, and, and pull out those key points to really target and hold in so that someone can transition between all of these different poly experiences that you have and how you want to utilize them in obtaining your next success. So there's no, you don't necessarily need to have that sort of chronological view anymore at that point. It's more of just a summary. Yeah. I, I think for that type of profile, it's okay to move away from a chronological uh, view. Everybody wants reverse chronology on a, on a resume because I want to know, are you a job hopper? How long did you stick right. at your last gig? Maybe it's a summary at the end of titles. Right. Or yeah, something. exactly. But in this, in this specific scenario, I think the best thing is a solid professional summary because you're going to rebrand yourself in a way that you're going to target what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And the best way to do that is sort of in a summary of your experience and really calling out those things in a, a, a little bit of a different format. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I like move. Potentialite. Nice job, Monica. I like that. <laughs> I'm a multi-potentialite. Oh, I and, see that. That's well, And you know, the other thing, as we go forward, like the whole wave of the future is supposed to be this poly consultant, right? So you're one person, you've got 15 different skill sets, one company doesn't want to use them. I mean, th there's a lot of talk about this in the industry. So I am a poly skill set professional and I'm going to market my recruiting skills to this person, my moderating skills to this person and my sales skills to this person and my operation experience to this person. And I'm going to work four gigs at the same time. And that is the future of what we're going to, especially when we have a skills deficit in this country and you know, we're bringing manufacturing back and there's all these opportunities that are coming up. We're going to be more and more in that environment. So fascinating. Yeah. We're going to move on to Rhonda to close us out today with LinkedIn advice. Rhonda. Thanks. You know, I, I love what you said, Zena. And um, I'd like to just add a couple things because it was just totally spot on. Um, one of the areas that I think is really important and often overlooked on LinkedIn um, is the featured section. And that's where you can actually have videos of people talking about your capabilities, whether you're somebody that's looking to attract new clients or you're looking for that next position. You can actually have, you know, string together four or five videos of people saying, you know, Pam Vetter is amazing. If you're looking for somebody to dot, 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 and literally what you're really talking about is the benefit, right? What it is that they do. So the one thing that I would say is, you know, don't ignore the featured section. The other thing too, and this kind of ties into, um, I love that last question about, you know, Polly, you do many, many things, right? Well, one of the things that I do with my clients, because I find that a lot, you know, you're, you're transitioning or you do many things, um, you find the common denominator. So for example, maybe you were in the service and what you can do is say, as an Air Force vet, I serve my country. Today, I serve my clients. Here are some of the results that my clients have received as a result of working with me. So you're tying the things together, but the place that you put all of those accomplishments is actually in projects on LinkedIn. And that's one of the most overlooked sections that I've ever seen. And what you do is in the about section, or even on a resume, for example, you can say, to see a list of my accomplishments, go to the project section. Now on a resume, what you might want to do, and you know, Zena, I don't know, I'm, this is not my area of expertise, but what I've heard a lot of people do when they're looking for a job is they go out and they get a website that says, hirepamvetter.com, okay? It's not like you're ever gonna find it unless somebody knows to go look for it. And then on that website, you have testimonials, you can have your accomplishments, you can have you know, really the guts and the benefit of what it is that you do. Um, when it comes to positioning yourself on LinkedIn, or if you're looking for a job, here's a great tip. Find out the people that you know are doing the hiring and then use Sales Navigator to find those people and start commenting on their posts. 
And yes, you can use AI, but make sure it's in your voice. Because I promise you with the amount of people, there's 1 million people on LinkedIn and less than 4% of them are posting. If you start commenting on somebody's post, they're gonna notice you. And if they notice you, they're gonna go look at your profile. So you know, if your profile is actually a good reflection of who you are, and you have all the elements that you know Zena was talking about, or if you're looking to attract new clients, Basically, what that about section is, is it's telling your story, but stay away from the word I, I, I. Nobody cares about you until they know what you can do for them, right? And lastly, contact information. And here's the one thing I don't think you mentioned this, Zena, but um, I'll tell you, this is something that I find really often overlooked and very important. I would never recommend putting your personal cell phone number on a LinkedIn profile or a resume. What you can do is get a Google voice number, get a second phone number, because here's the thing that's really interesting. If you give somebody your personal cell phone number, like me, for example, I've had mine since probably 2000, the same number. I don't live in an 805 area code, but I have an 805 cell number. If you put that in, you're gonna find out exactly where I live. And if you just take two more steps, you'll know how much I paid for my house, all everything. You don't want the world to know that because people are looking. There's actually an app. I don't know if you know this, Zena. It's super cool. It's called Candidate Lookup. It's in the Chrome store. And you can actually um, attach that to your, pro to your profile. And guess what it does? It tells you, now I can find your Facebook, your TikTok, your Instagram, your LinkedIn, any place that you are, because it's all out there, right? So you want to be careful what you are putting out there. And make sure people can contact you, but be really careful about what information you're putting out there. Don't put your personal cell phone number. Um, if you're looking for a job, I would not put a Calendly link, okay? You want to put a phone number that they, that they can reach you at. I just saw an ad on Facebook for a second phone for $99, right? It just, apps, you can, you know, it's kind of dedicated to your work phone and whatever. Um, and you can add a second phone number. Yeah, I saw that, Stephanie, which is awesome. Um, so I, I highly recommend that. But the other thing that I would really suggest is, you know, uh, like when I leave the house, I always say to my husband the same words, do I look okay? Now, after 44 years, he's never going to say, oh God, that, that outfit makes you look fat. He's smart enough not to say that, right? But, you know, he will say, oh, you have better outfits than you could wear. Well, if you're out there and you're branding yourself, right? Go to somebody you trust, somebody that really knows you and ask them for really honest feedback about how that resume looks, how that profile looks and say, hey, if you had somebody you were going to refer me to for that job or for that, you know, opportunity, and this was what they were looking at, do you feel comfortable? Because if they say no, then you want to talk to an expert and change it. Because you know what? It's all about those first impressions. So that's really all I would add to it. Um, I see somebody said they had their number on their LinkedIn page. If you've had that LinkedIn phone number for a while, Monica, guess what? I could figure out where you live and how much you paid for your house. I don't think you want that information out there, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, and, and how did I find that out? Well, when I got divorced in between marrying, I divorced, you know, I was married for 28 years, divorced my husband and remarried him. I was here, I was dating in my fifties. I figured out real quick that I wasn't putting my cell phone out there because I didn't want anybody to know where I was living or have that background information. So, you know, we're really all responsible for our own privacy, but really go find somebody that you trust, somebody that will give you an honest, honest answer um, of how they perceive you, because really it's just your own little mini focus group. So that's what I would lead it to. But I think you're, you're spot on, Zena. It was like, right, you know, you hit every single point. Um, and the last thing that I would add is, um, you know what, make sure your photo doesn't have a distracting background. You can use a, uh, an app called Remove BG. It takes the background off. But just make sure that you're smiling and it's a professional photo. And, it, you know, it's not match.com where you have one 10 years older than you are, right? It's actually a current photo. But you know what? It, we, we're all visuals. We really are. So, you know, neck up, you know, you know, you don't want to be perceived as something you're not, right? You know, like you don't want to be wearing a low cut shirt and, you know, you know, earrings that just, um, you know, are really whatever, 
you want to make sure that the impression that you're giving is one that's pretty neutral. Um, I recently changed my background. This is a Zoom background, but I used to have an unbelievable painting behind me. And what I realized was that it was just distracting, you know, that I wanted people looking at my face, not this gorgeous tapestry that was in back of me. So I just went and got like a plain old picture of plants. I mean, you can't get much more boring than that. But, but the reality is too, um, the one thing that I would say is, you know, when you start to have these one-on-one -on -one meetings that you're having, uh, make sure your background is clear. You know, you don't want to have one of those green screen backgrounds where you kind of see the hair is green and you're moving. It's so distracting. So all of those little things really, yeah. really count. Um, and that's all I would add, Pam. Zena? Yeah, I, I was going to, Rhonda brought up a point that um, I should have mentioned, and that is the social media. So we talked about, like, if you're a, if you're a graphic designer or a developer, uh, you know, you want to keep your format on your, on your LinkedIn and your resume very clean, but links to a GitHub or links to your personal website are awesome. We're all on social media, but if your social media is like a personal place where you share pictures with your family and your kids, keep it private or completely change the name and make sure you're only sharing out there in the LinkedIn world or with your resume, the GitHubs or the LinkedIn professional link or your Instagram because it's supporting your business brand. So whatever your social media links are that you're putting out there, keep them private if you're looking for work or you're selling your business um, to make sure that those social media things leave you judgment free from the perspective of your personal life, your politics, your, your all of those different things. And the other thing is keep yourself, people make this mistake all the time. It blows my mind, your email address, you know, instead of, you know, hot mama at hotmail.com, let's keep it at, you know, <laughs> right? Like Xena B or oh, sorry. You know, oh, so funny. <laughs> yeah, like whatever it might be, but I have, you would not believe some of the email addresses I see on resumes and even on LinkedIn profiles. So even if you just create it for the sole purpose of having it, you know, uh, on your LinkedIn profile or what have you do that, keep the, keep it professional. Even if you've been on SBC global or, or, or hotmail for a million years, set up a new. And the other thing is if you have hotmail or if you have SBC global, you look completely outdated, get a modern, a Gmail account or your own domain account or something like that to make sure that shows that you're up to date on technology. So yeah, Zena, that's a great point. And one of the things you can do with Google is, you know what, you can just have Rhonda at RhondaSure.com or Rhonda at the sure method.com. And you don't even have to have a website attached to that, but the perception is so different when you have that. And you don't know the person that's looking to decide whether they're going to make that next call to you, whether it's because they have an amazing lead for you or they potentially want to hire you. So the idea is, you you know, don't leave anything to chance, just like you said, Dina, Zena, about the typos and those kinds of things, right? And use Canva. You can do so many amazing things with Canva to be able to put your accomplishments in there, you know, put them in the featured section. And don't be afraid of QR codes. Um, QR codes are really great to lead people where you want them to go. But I wanted to just echo one thing you said, Zena, because it's so, so important, okay? Um, be careful what you're putting out there on social media. Seriously. You know what? Nobody cares about your political opinions. Nobody cares about which sports teams you like. Um, and that stuff is easy to find, even if you have your privacy settings set in a way where you think nobody can find it. Um, they're looking. They're looking. And, um, you know, my husband's retired and he started writing all this stuff. And I'm like, stop it. Stop putting that stuff out there. Nobody cares about your opinion and it's going to come back because you're a reflection of me, right? I really don't want your political opinions on Facebook. Go talk to your friends on the phone and don't record the calls, right? But again, Rhonda, be you don't know who's watching. Rhonda, do you have a session coming up? Do you want to throw anything in the chat? Um, I do actually, but it's strictly for real estate people. Oh. Um and, uh, and then I'm going to be doing another one that's coming up and I'm going to change the date. It was on the 18th, but I am doing a free webinar for anybody in real estate, if you know of anybody, and I'll put it in the chat. Um, okay. it's a webinar that's coming up. So yeah. Thank Thanks you all for, for coming and staying until the end. I am going to put in the chat also the link. If you want to join this group, I'll reach out separately as well, but this was fun, fun. And next month is even going to be better. You watch.
Okay. Thank, thank you again. You so much, thank Pam. you. Thank you, Pam. Pam. For, is your event for non high rise or high rise only? It's for it's anybody for that wants to come. Mine is for anybody. Okay. Oh. Yeah, her hers is yours is for real estate though, right? But that one's just for real estate. But here's the thing: it really applies to anybody, right? I mean, you know, it really does apply. Most of it is all because anybody that's in real estate is in sales, period, right? <laughs> They're all just looking to connect. And then I'm going to be doing another one that'll be generic. But come to the real estate one; it's free, and you'll <laughs> learn a lot. I share the coolest AI tools that I know of. So um, come have fun. I just want to say thank you so much, Pam. This was a great women's group. I honestly didn't really want to come. I was like, <laughs> hey, man, whatever. I, but I'm so glad I did. So thank you. Well, we're glad you came too. Okay. Have a good day, everybody. Bye, everybody. Yeah, thank you. So much. Bye. Bye.